to share this. We want to share today's presentation with the BFA trainers um, so they can use um, some of the knowledge within their training courses. And I think Daniel also wants to share it with some of his colleagues. So if you want to turn off your camera, if you don't want your face to appear on screen, you're welcome to do so. But um, it'd be mostly the presentation slides that are showing anyway. So as I said, Daniel is from Macbeth Insurance Brokers. Macbeths are an associate member of BIFA and they offer a range of insurance and financial services to both businesses and individuals. One of their specialist departments is dedicated to freight liability and marine insurance, and that is what Daniel is going to cover for us today. So over to you, Daniel. Okay, uh, hello um, everyone at the Young Forder Network. Thank you for having me. Um, I thought I would sort of cover today in the order of freight liability insurance, um, how it moves into cargo insurance, and then how we handle claims really, um, because that seems to be a nice way to sort of follow it. This is my first webinar, so if I stutter and fumble a little bit, just bear with me, please. Um, let's jump on to the next slide, please, Sharon. And um, so uh, as, as Sharon's highlighted, we are insurance brokers. We look after the broad spectrum, uh, spectrum of insurance needs. Um, we are specialists in the cargo and freight liability insurance sector and associate members of BIFA. My experience on the insurance side um, is about 15 years now. Um, the, the first three years of my freight and cargo experience were working in and out of warehouses, getting myself through college. Um, so I've done a little bit of the desk job that young forwarders are familiar with, um, as well as sort of the hands on um, approach in warehousing and couriering and that sort of thing. Um, my main customer base is freight forwarders, cargo owners um, and vessel charterers. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's crack on. Uh, next slide, please, Sharon. OK. So uh, first topic, um, I appreciate insurance is worthy. It's an invisible product. I'll try and keep this engaging in a way that you work um, as an individual sat there talking to customers. So we'll just cover off quickly what freight liability insurance is. And um, so it covers your legal liability in accordance with your contract conditions. Majority of people here are likely going to be operating under BIFA terms and conditions. So that little statement at the bottom of your email, all businesses transacted in accordance with the current edition of BIFA terms and trading conditions, they dictate what your liability is for loss and damage to goods. And that is what the freight liability policy covers when it comes to loss and damage to goods, the liability what BIFA says you have. Um, a policy will include cover for errors and omissions, um, and errors and omissions will include but not limit cover for things like misdirection, misdelivery, um, failure to comply with specific instruction, instructions, and clerical errors um, omitted. Um, your conditions of carriage, um, not just beef, but other um, conditions, will limit the extent of liability that you have or exclude it completely, whether that be for delay, consequential loss, or insufficient packaging, for example. Um, without properly incorporating um, contract conditions, it's important to know that you could fall liable uh, as what we call a common carrier. So your contract conditions stipulate who you are, you'll operate as an agent, you'll subcontract out to people that you don't, um, you'll subcontract out to people that operate boats, planes, vehicles, warehouses, and all the rest of it, um, as well as what your liability is. But if you don't incorporate any trading conditions, you're liable um, under common law, which is basically means you are liable for the full value of what you are moving and consequential losses that can apply should those goods be lost or damaged. So that's the brief explanation. What does that mean? How does it work? Uh, let's jump on to the next slide, please, Sharon. Let's take a nice, easy starting example before we get into the chart and everything that we've got here. Let's imagine I sat on, on, on the image up here behind a desk dealing with a customer that wants to move a tonne's worth of machinery that's worth £10,000, for example. So let's imagine we work at ABC Freight and we operate under Bifford's terms and conditions and we lose that customer's pallet of machinery. Oh, dear. What, what a shame we've done that, unfortunately. Um, what are we going to pay the customer? The goods are worth £10,000. Well, under our terms and conditions, we're liable for two SDRs per kilo. So if we look at the chart, we can see that BIFA applies to freight forwarders. Liability for loss and damage to goods is two SDR per kilos or the value of the goods, whichever is the lesser amount. In the majority of cases, it's going to be the two SDRs per kilo. What is an SDR, Daniel? What, what were you talking about already? You've lost me. So an SDR is an international reserve asset. 
it's not a currency, but for all intents and purposes of what you're dealing with, it will tell you how much per SDR you're going to need to give to your customer. So the IMF will use um, a basket of five currencies to determine what the current pound is per SDR, what the current dollar is, along with all the other currencies that currently apply around the globe, the main majority of them anyway. So at the mo as of this morning, an SDR was 1.092410 Great British Pounds. But to, to keep this nice and easy, we'll work on £1.10 per SDR to keep the numbers nice and easy. So going back to our one pallet, one ton bit of machinery, one ton at two SDRs per kilo, £1.10 an SDR, that's about £2,200 per tonne. So if we lose that pallet of machinery and we pay out our customer £2,200 for that tonne, because that's all we're liable for, they are short, but they've not got a full £10,000 payout. That is how liability is limited on the weight-related basis. So what if we're moving this piece of machinery and we give it to someone else to do something with? What if you give it to a warehouse keeper to look after it for us? We'll notice, and these trade these trade associations are the main ones that we're likely, you are likely going to encounter here in the UK. Aqua storage and RHA storage conditions, you will note limit liability to £100 per tonne. So all we're going to get from the warehouse keeper is £100. So your freight liability insurance policy is going to pay out that £2,200 and it's going to recover £100 from the warehouse keeper. That's why you need the freight liability insurance. And it's also why the warehouse keeper needs the freight liability insurance. What if we give them to a haulier here in the UK? The majority of hauliers operate under RHA terms and conditions, similar to Logistics UK. Um, they have liability at £1,300 per tonne. So again, we're not getting the full £2,200 that we're liable for. We are getting something from that, from that member of that trade association. So the difference there is then going to be topped up by our freight liability insurance provider, always less of policy excess, of course. Now conventions come into it on the right hand side of the chart. So I've put the main ones up that you're going to encounter being Hague Bisbee rules in the main perceived rate. You'll notice when we look at the conventions, they also have liability dictated on the SDR basis. And that's because we're dealing with international trade. So why BIFA as one of the UK trade bodies that operates on an international trade basis has liability based on an SDR basis. So Hague Visby, 666.67 SDRs per package or two SDRs per kilo, uh, whichever is the higher amount. Usually it's the two SDRs per kilo amount. Um, Warsaw, Montreal, 17 SDRs, 22 SDRs. Those apply to air freight movements. So Hague Visby will apply to vessel owners, vessel operators. Warsaw, Montreal will apply to airline operators. The main one that you're likely going to deal with and encounter um, is going to be the CMR convention. And you'll notice on the right hand side, the CMR note sort of hiding behind the RHA logo. Because chances are, if you've got a European road freight movement, you're going to hand the goods over to a haulier that's probably going to incorporate RHA terms and conditions. But when we go into Europe for European road freight, the CMR convention is like a guillotine. It's law. Conventions are law and legislation. They will supersede your trading conditions. And you'll notice that under CMR, the liability level is a lot higher at 8.33 SDRs per kilo. Um, at the current rate, it's £9,163 per tonne. Um, so our £10,000 bit of machinery that's unfortunately been lost or damaged in Europe, we've still not got the full £10,000 back. OK, under CMR, we have got a little bit more. We've got a bit for carriage charges, customs duties and other charges, which, the, which people will be liable for under CMR. Um, and you, if you are dealing directly with the customer, are liable in accordance with the CMR convention. It will apply to you as first carrier if you're dealing directly with the cargo owner. If you've received a job from another forwarder, you're not liable as first carrier. That's something important to note, but we could probably have a separate webinar on the CMR convention and how it applies to you. But that is the short of it. And that is how the freight liability policy will pay out on a liability basis. So the majority of people here as a BFA member, it's £2,200 per tonne. If we end up dealing with someone where we can get more compensation from a customer, we'll give them more compensation brilliantly. But at the most, it will be 20, at the most usually it's that £2,200 per tonne at the 2SDR level. And we'll try and recover something back from anyone else who's responsible for that loss or damage um, to goods in the contractual chain that we um, that we um, engage with. Um, so 
what about my ten thousand pounds as the cargo owner for mr machinery and mrs machinery um let's jump on to the next slide please sharon so what is the cargo owner's options they can move the goods on an uninsured basis there's no legal requirement to arrange cargo insurance it's completely up to them if they want it or they don't want it they can accept that liability is limited and they can rely on the liability levels that they're going to be reimbursed for and um, what are the what are the pros and cons of that the pros are they're going to save money on their insurance premium the cons are unfortunately potentially going to well outweigh that pro um, liability is usually negligence based we've had customers that have held goods in warehouses and those warehouses have been subject to flash floods not because the building's poorly maintained or not because the area was in an area subject to flood or anything like that at all it's purely a one-off incident they've not done anything wrong in looking after the cargo and because there has been an incident like that it was deemed that they did not have a liability for the goods that they were holding so that reliance on liability under trading conditions suddenly needs a bit of reconsideration. If we're moving goods via sea freight, there is a situation where general average could apply. The most recent spoken about event where general average applies, uh, applied was the vessel um, Evergreen that blocked the Suez Canal where the vessel owner declared general average. And what that means is the cargo owner needs to contribute towards the costs of any damaged vessels or recovering that vessel. And that can be quite expensive. So the customer trying to save money on that £10,000 bit of machinery, suddenly they can be out of pocket and not have their £10,000 bit of machinery and having to pay some money towards the shipping line in the event of a general average claim. So cargo insurance is definitely beneficial. The next option then um, when they take that into account is they can make their own insurance arrangements. Um, and many shippers do, they will, they will potentially have their own cargo insurance policy. Um, there are many that don't, more, more cargo is not insured in international transit than insured. Um, some buyers here in the UK, being the United Kingdom, we buy more in than we export out. So you are likely to deal with people buying goods in um, more than you are exporting goods. That might not always be the case, but in, in, the, in the majority of cases, that's the way it works out in the freight industry. So if they buy goods from the Far East, for example, I imagine quite a few people are dealing with Far East to UK type movements. The seller may not insure the goods for the whole journey. They may only insure them until they're put on the boat. Uh, they may only insure them until they arrive at the UK port. And that's something that things called INCO terms will, will address. Uh, and will dictate and we'll come on to inco terms separately so if the part if you are buying goods here in the uk and you rely on the seller's insurance it's important to understand where they are insuring the goods up to and where they are delivering them to because sometimes their insurance and where they're delivering to may actually cross over and may not always go to destination but we'll cover that off on inco terms their third option is to ask the freight forwarder to arrange the cargo insurance for them and to do that, the freight forwarder can contact their insurance broker or their, their own insurance company. They may have a forwarder's declaration facility in place, um, what we would call an annual cargo declaration facility, um, where they can actually purchase insurance for their customers um, and declare movements under that. So customers got three options. One, don't insure the goods. Two, arrange their own cover. Or three, ask you to arrange the insurance as the freight forwarder for them. Um, can we jump onto the next slide, please, Sharon? So what does the cargo insurance cover then? Okay, we know what the freight liability policy is covering for the freight forwarder. It's important to know it covers the freight forwarder for their liability. Cargo insurance is a separate contract which covers all risks of physical loss and damage to goods. So it starts off by stating, as always, with insurance, it will cover everything. Um, it will include general average. So if there is a situation of general average, it will pay out for a general average claim um, and salvage charges. Then we move on to the typical things that are excluded. So most cargo policies are going to exclude war on land, um, atomic nuclear weapons, willful, willful misconduct of the insured. If the customer does something intentionally that damages a product, an insurance company is not going to reimburse them for it. Um, inherent vice. Not everyone's familiar with inherent vice. That is something that naturally happens to a product. So fruit and vegetables will deteriorate over a length of time. That's something that's naturally going to happen. Um, we've been involved in claims for retail packaging, where the retail packaging will turn up to a manufacturer to then have product put in them. 
and the glue has not been able to withstand the heat, the moisture, the cold temperatures that the goods that the um, goods have travelled through through various regions to get to their destination. So the inherent vice would exclude a situation like that. The product isn't suitable to carry out that transit. It's not something you're going to be able to claim against your cargo insurance for. Um, it will also exclude losses as a result of delay. So um, looking again at the uh, vessel ever given by the um, owned by the vessel owner Evergreen, that caused untold disruption and untold delay. Now delay isn't covered under a cargo policy as standards. So the delays that were caused, there was no actual financial loss to the majority of people with goods on board. The goods weren't lost. Okay, they had issues trying to get their goods sold and delivered to customers. There were delays as a result of that, but that's not something that's picked up by the cargo policy. Um, I've also got um, the container line, the container line hanging um, image up there because insolvency of a vessel owner operator is also something that's excluded. Hanjin, uh, you may or may not be familiar with, um, was a container shipping line that did, go in, uh, that did go into insolvency. And they hadn't paid ports to offload the containers that they had on their boats. And what the port operators basically said was, well, if we've not been paid, we're not offloading your boats. And what the cargo owners had to do was pay their freight forwarders more money to get their cargo offloaded from the boats. So again, that's not loss or damage to the goods themselves. Sea freight, air freight, international movements are still seen as an adventure. It's still, you know, that big blue wobbly thing is dangerous out there. And a lot of things can happen to goods. A lot of things can cause delay for goods arriving at destination. Unfortunately, shipping lines do go insolvent. Um, and there isn't a physical loss or damage to goods in that type of eventuality. What I will highlight is that your um, trading conditions under BIFA, particularly anyway, do entitle you to pass on additional freight charges to customers in that type of eventuality. Um, so there are sometimes questions about where cover starts and where it finishes. I often see warehouse to warehouse stated on things like letters of credit or we're asked, does it cover door to door? And the answer to that is no. The goods are covered from the point they are picked up at the, pla the um, place that they commence their transit from. So what we say by warehouse to warehouse, does that mean when it gets outside the door, when it goes on the vehicle? No. Commencement is when the goods are picked up and it covers and the cover remains in place until they are put down at final destination, unless INCO terms dictate otherwise. Um, so an INCO term may well state that cover doesn't start until the goods are on the boat, but I'll come on to that separately. So that's where freight liability insurance is. That's where cargo insurance is and what cover you get under a cargo insurance facility. Um, so I'll move on to what notes you guys need to take into account when you offer cargo insurance. So common questions that we usually get are, can we insure everything that I'm really worried about having limited liability? I'm not okay with it. I'm not comfortable with it. So let's take into account what you're doing. You're collecting a freight charge in return for moving something from A to B. So your financial interest is in your freight charge. Your customer's financial interest is in the value of their goods. And usually the value of the goods is a lot greater than what the freight charge is. So that's why the law allows you to limit your liability in accordance with the trading conditions that you operate and why trade associations like BFA and all the rest of them exist. So it's important to note that you don't have an insurable interest in the cargo. Your interest is in your freight charge. You can't just insure any of your customers' goods. It's a bit like me trying to insure my next door neighbor's property. If something happened to it, I don't lose out financially. With respect to the cargo, it's the insurable interest is with the cargo owner, not yourself. If you are selling insurance to a cargo owner, you're acting as an agent on behalf of the insurance company selling that insurance to the customer. Um, so you were never the insured party. It's always the customer that is the insured party. You being able to arrange the cover is always subject to you being able to obtain it. There are rare circumstances where forwarders will call us up and say, look, we've agreed to arrange insurance. Can you give us a price? Really, the quest, that question should be asked before you agree to arrange the cover. So it's important to make sure that you can obtain the cover for the particular goods that you're moving, whether that be a one-off movement with a broker or whether it be under your own annual cargo declaration facility always make sure you can arrange the cover before offering it to the customer. I'll come on to procedures separately. Um, so this is ultimately a value added service that you offer to customers when you offer to arrange cargo insurance for them. You are entitled to charge what they call a fair and reasonable admin fee. 
um, to cover the costs incurred, and those do need to be disclosed to a client. Um, I put a separate line in again, reiterating, you may not always be able to arrange the insurance. Um, let's jump on to the next slide, Sharon. So with this topic, this is with respect to annual forwarders cargo insurance policy. Some of you may have access to a declaration type facility. Some of you may have thought about getting one, which gives you the ability to sell insurance to customers. Some of you may have heard of them, but not really know anything about them. So I'm kind of hitting three birds with one stone on this one. So I'll start off with what the policy actually covers. So it starts off by basically giving you the ability to offer insurance to customers for general merchandise. And general merchandise is deemed a commodity that isn't necessarily theft attractive, fragile, you know, it's not something that raises any alarm bells with an insurance company. There's not a definitive list as to what general cargo is, but the policy will give you a list of excluded goods. So the main ones are going to be your typical theft attractive items, money, cash, bullion, mobile phones, computer chips, fragile items, glass, marble, antiques. That, that, you know, it's, it's common sense sort of stuff as to what is excluded. Um, the policy will usually give you a limit. It will give you a list of excluded goods. It will give you a list of excluded countries. It doesn't mean that you can't exceed the limit or cover an excluded good. You just need to refer that to an insurer, to your broker prior to the transit commencing with a bit of notice um, so that the cover can be arranged prior to the transit commencing. Another question that we get asked about quite a bit on these policies is what the basis of valuation is. So some customers will ask for a certain amount of cover. And when we dig into what the goods are worth, we usually establish that there needs to be a bit of a review as to what the customer is actually going to be re reimbursed for. So most of these policies will give you cover under the basis of valuation section for CIF plus 10 percent. Other, other reasonable amounts can be agreed. But what is CIF plus 10 percent? So C is cost, I is insurance and F is freight. So say we add nine thousand pounds worth of machinery and we were charging 50 quid for insurance. So your value now is 9,050 pounds. Say the freight was 950 pounds. That gives you a nice round number of 10,000 pounds. Plus 10%, that gives you 11,000 pounds. Okay, why are we insuring the freight and why are we insuring 10%? Why are we actually insuring the insurance charge itself? If the goods don't get to their destination, not only is the customer potentially gonna to have to buy them and ship them again, they're gonna to have to pay for the shipping again. They're gonna to have to pay for the insurance again. 10%, that takes into account things like fuel surcharge changes, potential changes in freight rates, freight rates, currency um, fluctuations, and that sort of thing. So that's the re main reason why the 10% uplift is added to a basis of valuation. It's not something the customer has to take. The customer can dictate what basis of valuation they want. And CIF plus 10% doesn't work on every occasion. We've been asked to look at things like dinosaur skeletons, and then you have to ask the question, okay, what if we lose a toe? You know, what happens to the value of the goods then? We sometimes have to look quite in depth as to what the value of goods is and how we establish the basis of what that valuation is. Uh, next slide, please, guys. So a couple of more points to take into account. Um, so when you have an open cargo declaration facility or if you're offering cover on a, on a fact basis, most insurers are going to require that you follow a certain procedure when offering cargo insurance to customers. So quotes in writing, make sure they're in writing, not over the phone. You're usually going to have to supply an IPID, an insurance policy information document or a key facts document. That basically gives the key information as to what the policy covers and what it doesn't cover. So it's a bit of information to the customer about what they're receiving. Um, if the customer is happy with what you've offered and they want to go ahead, then you're going to likely need to issue a certificate of insurance when you're asked to proceed. And that is the customer's contracted insurance. So similar to when you get your car insurance, you'll get a certificate of insurance. Um, certificate of insurance in cargo is just simply done because it's the easiest way to evidence a, con a contract of insurance. It's not done like with cargo with car insurance because it's a legal requirement. It's just an easier way of facilitating it with a cargo insurance policy. Um, another item I wanna bring up is arranging the cover prior to transit. We do sometimes get asked to arrange cover after goods have been picked up. And that's, a, and that, that's quite common. Sometimes a cargo owner will just simply forget to arrange insurance if they don't have their own policy. And then they might call you in a panic saying, I've not insured the goods, can you do something for me? That's fine, you know, simply just disclose that. If you're in a situation where the goods are 10 minutes down the road 
and they've been and they've traveled halfway around the world you might not be able to arrange the cover at that stage it's unlikely you're going to be able to if the goods have just been picked up in china for example and not put on board the boat you're more likely uh, going to get cover at that point but it's important to make sure that the cover is arranged prior to that collection point that we spoke about prior to goods being picked up for the purpose of their onward transit to destination and um, if you do have an annual policy it's important to note that claims will always drive up premiums. They will drive up the rates that you have. And higher premiums make this value added service less attractive to your other customers that you're offering it to. And if you get someone calling you in a bit of a panic and it's something a bit untoward that you're not too familiar with, bear in mind they might be doing that because they don't have their own cargo policy for a reason. They might have poor claims. They might have had previous issues with arranging cargo insurance and they're now using you as a last resort. You don't have to offer cargo insurance for every customer. It's not something that is required by law or anything like that to you. Your stance can be, it's not something we have to do, it's not something we do. So if you treat these policies wisely, everyone can enjoy the benefit from them, all of your other customers and yourselves included. Uh, next slide, please. So INCO terms, uh, which what we've talked, uh, what we've um, touched on a couple of times. So. INCO terms are basically guidelines and rules put forward by the International Chamber of Commerce and they revise them periodically. Uh, 2020 was the most recent update and basically they help a buyer and a seller assess who's responsible for what at what stage during the transit. So people involved in international movements, you might be asked to pick something up from a warehouse in China, but between the seller and the buyer, what have they agreed? Has the seller agreed that they'll put the goods on the vehicle? Have they agreed to put them on the boat? Have they agreed to deliver them to the UK port? Where has all this been agreed? The INCO terms are pretty good at demonstrating what the buyer and the seller have agreed to do. And they also assist with who's responsible for the goods at what point during transit. The three most common INCO terms you're likely going to encounter are going to be XWorks, FOB and CIF. So imports are likely going to be on an XWorks or an FOB basis. So under XWorks, EXW, uh, the top left hand corner there, the seller would be responsible for handing the goods over to the buyer at their premises. Say this was an import from China, they would be responsible for handing the goods over to the haulier when they arrive to pick the goods up. Once they're on that vehicle, that's it. They're the buyers and the buyer should really be arranging insurance from that point. On an FOB basis, the seller would agree to put the goods onto the boat. Once that container is placed on the boat, transfer of ownership is then the seller's and the insurance then for the seller needs to come into place. So for an import, those are the two that you're mainly, that you're mainly going to see. Um, CIF, um, the main factor on CIF to take into account is that insurance is arranged by the seller under CIF INCO terms. So if we were in the UK selling something to China, we would be agreeing to insure the goods under CIF terms. The ownership would transfer over to the buyer when the goods are put onto the boat here in the UK. So when they're loaded onto the boat, the interest of mine, the seller, is then the buyer's. But the insurance continues to destination under that INCO term. Now, CIF can deviate from covering to destination. Sometimes you'll see on invoices, CIF, you, uh, I don't know, Felton Warehouse or CIF Felixstowe port, your destination might be down in Dorset. So the transit and the cover would cease at that warehouse, and it's then your responsibility to go and get those goods from the warehouse or from the port. So that's something just to take into account with INCO terms, if there is a destination next to the INCO term on the purchase invoice. Um, so those are the main principles under what, under what INCO terms operate under. They're not legally binding. They're not, they're, they're not um, legislative, sorry. Uh, you can deviate from them. You do not have to incorporate them, but they are pretty good and pretty useful for buyers and sellers. And they're definitely helpful for yourselves when it comes to determining who's responsible for what during a transit, particularly on the insurance point of view. Um, right, uh, next slide, please, guys. So claims, um, not everything is plain sailing, unfortunately, as the riot image sort of portrays. Um, the other image there is the Tianjin port explosion back in 2017, I think, um, where quite a large number of containers and vehicles, 12,500 vehicles, 7,500 containers were destroyed in an explosion. 
Um, so they, they do happen and they are well beyond our control, sat behind our desk dealing with our customer. Um, so it's quite a good idea to familiarise yourself with insurance with insurance companies' uh, claims procedures, just so that you're prepared in pre pre uh, prepared in advance. Um, the procedure can be saved, set to one side, or uh, you know somewhere nearby, so it's the hand in the event you do need it. Um, the procedure is quite similar for freight liability and cargo insurance claims when it comes to loss and damage. The main exception on freight liability claims is errors and emissions. Um, errors and emissions will likely need to be discussed um, on their merit because they do vary. You know, an error and emission uh, claim can vary and different information is required, different documentation is required depending on the circumstances. But it's information that you'd likely expect an insurance company to want. You'd want them to, you, they would want you to establish what the likely amount of the claim is going to be. So from a freight liability perspective, we're concerned about both the value of the goods and the weight of the goods. So our one ton pallet, we know under B for our liability is 2,200 pounds. We want to write to our customer slash claimant now and, and advise them that unfortunately their goods have been lost and damaged, lost or damaged. Um, and we want to remind them that liability is limited under our trading conditions. So if they do have their own cargo policy, they can engage with their cargo insurer and get the ball rolling with their own insurance policy. The next important thing you should do, and I should probably put this as number one on my bullet point list, is write to all of your subcontractors that you engage with for the movement and hold them responsible um, for the loss or damage that has occurred because they will likely have time limitations. An RHA member, for example, if you don't write to them within seven days holding them responsible, then that time limitation has passed and you're going to have difficulty making a claim against them unless you've got good reason for it. So write out to all of your subcontractors holding them responsible the moment you become aware of a claim. Uh, that is the most important item that you need to address. Um, and then there's a case of following the um, insurance claims procedure that your insurer will have and detailing your references, dates of the voyages, voyage information, circumstances that led up to the loss or damage, um, and also information with respect to weights and values. And those are usually submitted along with the supporting documentation. So the customer's invoice, the customer's packing list, your consignment notes, Loading and unloading reports, they're pretty important. You know, you can have multiple vehicles, multiple multiple consolidation points involved in the transit. So it actually helps pinpoint where the loss or damage occurred. So if someone collected goods and they're in perfectly good order and they delivered them and the collection point is signed for them that they're smashed, you know that the damage has occurred whilst, that, whilst those goods are on that vehicle. It helps determine where goods were lost or damaged. Um, and then you need to submit that correspondence to your insurance company for them to be able to facilitate the claim. Uh, next slide, please. So this brings us on to um, cargo claims. So similar situation, we're working more on value on this basis. So establish the value of the loss, make sure you get in touch with the insurance company as soon as possible. Again, hold your freight forwarder as the cargo owner responsible. If you're the freight forwarder selling a cargo policy, again, hold your subcontractors responsible. Um, and do that as soon as possible because again the time limitations apply and then it's a similar claims process um, you know following the required claims procedure document and submitting the information and documents that insurers require a uh, couple of images here top right one that, that was an internal container fire that broke out so you probably have a decent loading report on that one and it's only going to be when the container doors are open that we realize something's happened whilst the goods have been inside the container um, top left we've got a cargo vessel listing and, and containers falling over the side. You'll notice on the right hand side of the vessel, the containers are completely gone. Um, bottom left hand corner, we've got the MOL Comfort. Um, that was about 10 years ago now, um, that vessel broke in two. Um, I think that was the worst container ship loss in maritime naval history. Um, the vessel basically broke in two. You can see the top image where you can just see the bridge uh, you can't see the MOL logo. You can see bottom right hand corner where the hull actually broke, uh, but next to the L part, uh, part of the MOL logo. So one part of it started to float away from the other. Tugs tried to save it. Uh, this happened off the Yemenese coast. Um, I think they tried to get in one part of it back to India. Unfortunately, it caught fire uh, and ended up sinking the bit that they managed to get close to India. Um, Bottom right hand corner um, is uh, some parrots, some avocados that have perished. I personally was involved in um, some movements from East Africa to Europe. And unfortunately, despite thinking we covered all bases, 
we had loading reports for these items going onto vehicles. We had someone sat with the vehicle until it arrived at the airport or the port of loading to make sure that the fridges weren't turned off during transit. What came to light was for the air freight imports was that the airports in East Africa, I won't name uh, which one because uh, for obvious reasons, um, but it turned out they had the facility to refrigerate um, these avocados and keep them cold, but the fridges are broken at the time. So we ended up with about seven loads of avocados that arrived and about 130,000 pound in losses within a couple of months. Um, in that type of scenario, uh, you can end up with your cargo insurance being canceled, which is what happened with this particular cargo owner. Um, so I think I've overrun a tad, apologies for that. Um, but yeah, if we move on to the next slide. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. Uh, any questions at all? Uh, I think we're gonna move on to the current list that we've got. Yes, thanks, Daniel. Um, a lot of information there. Um, I hope Sorry, it, that's uh, insurance. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, hope it's, I hope it's all clear as mud, everybody. Um, Hey, um, Elias, uh, I think you've volunteered to help out with these questions now. So if you just read the question out on screen and then Daniel's going to answer for us. Elias, you're still on mute at the moment. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you. Okay. Um, so did coronavirus have a significant effect on a number of claims made and insurance purchased? Not massively, to be honest with you. Delays were a problem, but noting that obviously, you know, you're not liable for losses as a result of delay under your trading conditions, and it's not something that's covered as standard under a cargo policy. Um, you know, so claims for delay were we only saw claims for sort of perishable goods that had tailored insurance cover in that type of scenario. Um, so it was more to do with perishable goods where they couldn't be offloaded um, and there were slowdowns at ports, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah, that, those were the main claims that we saw. We did have people inquiring about the effects of delay, um, but those were the standard answers um, that a lot of people received. Just because goods are sat out of port waiting to be offloaded, a lot of items can sit there for a fair amount of time. You know, noting that a sea freight voyage can be sort of three to six to 12 weeks, for example, you know, worst case scenario. Um, you know, whilst there were delays, it, that they goods weren't halted ultimately. So, not massively is the answer to that question. Okay, thank you. Um, what is the largest insurance claim you have encountered in your career, and what was the outcome of this claim? Uh, that was a multi-million-pound mobile phone theft, um, and that was settled. Uh, what is the most high key insurance incident you know? For example, number of containers destroyed or special cargo lost? Uh, might, might have touched on this one already. So that, that was the Tianjin port explosion. There was the image of the aftermath there with the burnt out cars. Um, so according to Wikipedia, I had to double check this myself, 12,428 cars were destroyed. 7,533 containers were destroyed. That's the main impact from the cargo perspective. In addition to that, there were 304 buildings destroyed. So that's the worst one in my personal experience that I've seen. Um, I would like to, I would like the speaker to further explain the dangers of setting a pre precedent when doing claim related commercial decisions. Okay, right. I'll try, I'll try and keep this as brief as I can. So if during the process of a claim, you wish to make a, a commercial decision that deviates from the claims procedure or deviates from your insurance company's instruction, you run the risk of your policy be, of your policy cover being void and your claim not being paid. Always run a commercial decision past your insurance company if it deviates from the procedure or from their instruction, because they may be able to, typical commercial decisions that I see are, look, this is a good customer of mine, I'm not happy with the limited liability. I want to give them a bit more just to show that I'm a better forwarder and we want to take care of them. So I completely understand why sometimes those decisions are made. You know, insurance is insurance, terms and conditions are terms and conditions, but business is business. Um, so if you are going to do something like that, talk to your insurance company about it. They may well be able to give you a without prejudice declaration acceptance form that will actually be able to sign off this as a one-off 
um, event, one off, one off decision that's being made, one off financial offer, um, and that will sweep it under the rug and it will not set a precedent for future events because you could find yourself then buying, bound to that customer in future to pay for differences. Like I mentioned earlier, your financial interest is your freight charge. The reason liability is limited is because the freight charge is usually less than that to the value of the goods. So you end, you end up in a position where you are not as financially well off as the cargo owner and the cargo owner is asking you for compensation on a cargo owner level which just isn't fair on a freight forwarder in that type of scenario um, so i hope that covers the intent of that question and that and if, i think it's the last one so if there's anything that's, else at all yeah that's the last of the um questions asked in advance so thanks Elias, for helping out there um Sara, you volunteered i think to ask the questions that have been put in the chat box. I've noticed actually Hazel has been busy. Um, Hazel Downs <laughs> is a colleague of Daniel's at Macbeth's and there are some questions in the chat box and Hazel has been um, typing in some answers. So if, um, if perhaps we just quickly um, work We'll, we'll do the questions, we'll read out the questions that have been asked and um, and we've got Hazel's um, responses and then if Daniel's got anything further to add, we can we can do that. So Clara, if you want to take yourself off mute and um, read out the question and then quickly read out the answer that you should be able to see there from Hazel and then Daniel can decide whether he wants to add anything more. Can you see the questions in the chat box, Clara? Okay, we, we're not hearing you, Clara. Daniel, can you see the questions yourself in the chat box? Yeah, yeah, I, I can see them. I'm, I'm happy to answer them. So uh, first one we've got up here. For FOB, what, happen, what happens if something happens to the cargo whilst it's being transferred from the key to the boat? Um, Who is responsible? Okay, uh, so do you know I'm not going to read Hazel's answer. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll risk it. The so same then. <laughs> if those if, if those goods aren't on the boat, placed on the boat, secured on the boat, they're not on the boat. So FOB and code terms stipulate when cover is on the boat. So if something happens at the key, it's still the responsibility of the seller. Um, yeah, Hazel has said the same thing. Luckily, <laughs> uh, B for terms and conditions. What's the general accepted time limitation practiced in the UK? Fourteen days is the claim notification period, and a claim needs to be settled within nine months. Um, hi, Daniel. If we buy an open forwarder's declaration policy, are we allowed to resell the insurance to our customer at a price we decide? Given it's a bit harder to quantify what the cost on an individual shipment would be, do we have that freedom? No, you don't. You are allowed to charge a fair and reasonable administration fee. Um, and those are the guidelines that are put forward and you need to be able to justify that. So if, you know, some people might only charge, you know, tens of pounds, some people might charge a couple of hundred pounds. If you've got something that's quite in depth and you're allocating a lot of time to it, you need to be able to assess what assess and explain what is fair and reasonable. You know, some people have different, you know, some people, you know, are going to cost more than others. So what's fair and reasonable to one isn't fair and reasonable to another. Um, but yeah, if you can just if you can justify it in a fair and reasonable way, a set amount, um, then that's OK. Um, the, the, what was the next one? Do you see two SDR per kg increasing anytime soon? I'm not aware of it personally, um, and the answer to that is so. The answer to that is no. I don't see that increase in any time personally. Um, right, got another one that's come in. What do your roles and responsibilities cover in the insurance company? Work hours? Do you have to work a lot of overtime when dealing with big claims? Uh, so I'll highlight: we are a brokerage. We're not an insurer. So when a customer comes to us, we will search around the market for the best deal um, available for them. Uh, best deal isn't always priced. Sometimes it's cover derived. Um, so you might end up paying more for a better level of cover than you will in terms of insurance premium. Um, working hours, we are nine to five, Monday to Friday. Um, those are pretty standard working clerical hours. 
uh, do you have to work a lot of overtime when dealing with big claims? There are occasions where we do work overtime, um, but I, th I think that's the same in any sector really, um, no more or less than what you probably experience in any other sector. But yeah, I think that's all of them, Sharon, unless there's anything else. One more just, got... If a customer Oops. wanted insurance, could we come to you? <laughs> oh, here we go. Sorry, I've not scrolled down. Yeah, yes, you, you're more than welcome to come to us. <laughs> Okay. All right. Right. Well, thank you, everybody, for your questions. Um, there's been a lot of good questions there. I'm going to um, we'll stop taking questions now, and I am going to stop the recording because we'll just go on to um, 